Así, así. Can you, can you hear us? Yes, okay. This is OL Nation, Series 1, Session 3. Uh, this is the series of interactive webinars of OLs, by OLs, and for OLs. And we focus on thought leadership, mentoring, networking, professional enhancement, and anything that will get our OL community together. Welcome to Laurentians, past, present, and for the future, friends of Lovedale and families. I am Rohan Shetty, Vindhya, 1986, your convener and host. On behalf of the OL Nation Working Group and a, a wider body of helpers, volunteers, and uh, advisors, welcome once more. We have a great session lined up for you uh, this, uh, this evening. This is Independence Day month, and we have Nikhil with Anuli and Saz uh, with Central Chengalvarayan sharing their points of view with us. I hope their stories resonate with you. And we now hand over to Kalpana Kutaya, my co-host. Kalpana is an architect at Perkins and Will, and she's, she's established herself in the United States as an architect uh, specializing in the healthcare industry. She is now gonna take over and introduce you to our panelists. Welcome, Kalpana. I appreciate that introduction, Rohan. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being with us today. It is my pleasure to be the co-host for the session. Like Rohan said, since it's the Independence Day month, uh, the OL Nation Working Committee has put together two sessions and uh, that resonate that theme. For both sessions on the webinar, please post your any questions you might have on the Q&A link. For others on YouTube and FaceTime, we have volunteers who will pick up your questions and communicate them to the moderators. Depending on the time we have, the moderators will try get to get to all the questions and answers. And if we run out of time, we'll surely get back to you. It is my pleasure to introduce the moderator for the first session, Anuli Katakam, Dave the House, batch of 1990, who will be in conversation with my classmate, Nickel Day, Smero House, batch of 1980. Their session is titled, We the People, Citizenship and the Idea of India. Anuli works as the deputy editor at Frontline Magazine in Mumbai. As a journalist for about almost 23 years, she covers national news of the Western region. Being part of the News Bureau, Anuli reports on current affairs, which include politics, calamities, communal tension, terror, and economic crime. Her interests and the news she mostly covers are those around labor, women's issues, marginalized communities, urban development, and the urban poor. Anuli writes under the official name Anupama Katakam. She lives in Mumbai with her husband and two children. Anuli, please unmute your mic and take it away. Thanks, Kalpana. Thank you, OL Nation. It's so good to connect with uh, all our engines across different batches. Um, I've been really looking forward to this. I'm gonna get, get into it right away. India's Right to Information Act is considered one of the most advanced legislations Thank in you. the world. Is that a problem? As a journalist, I would say, if we have to survive this current climate and evolve as a nation, it is the RTI that will empower us. Most important, however, it is the most powerful tool for the common man. And for that alone, RTI is absolutely invaluable. So, therefore, we are very privileged to have the inspiring and unstoppable Nikhil Day. Uh, Nikhil has spearheaded the RTI movement from 1995 until it was passed in 2005. Um, he, Nikhil is a social activist based in Rajasthan. In 1990, he, along with Aruna Roy and Shankar Singh, founded the Mazdoor Kisan Shakti Sangatan, based out of a village in Rajasman district near Odaipur, where he presently lives. Nikhil has been centrally involved in large statewide campaigns on education, labor, and human rights. His experience with core issues for the poor, such as minimum wage, food rights, land education naturally gives him an in-depth perspective on what a large portion of marginalized and vulnerable people in our country have to live with. He is here to speak about his journey, issues of transparency and accountability, and how all of us can exercise our democracy and help the underprivileged. I know he plans to engage us in some topical and very, very relevant issues. 
Nikhil will make a 15 minute presentation following which he and I will get into a discussion and then we will open the floor to questions. Uh, we have a lot of ground to cover, some very interesting topics. So over to the man who wrote in the Laurentian five years ago about what it was to move from Sumeru house to a village hut. Over to you, Nikhil. Thanks so much, Anli, and thanks everyone to InOL Nation. Um, this, what Anuli just talked about, it is a great opportunity for me to talk to, not just the class, which I've had a chance to talk to. Actually, my life ever since I left Lawrence has been, uh, it's taken a very different direction. And certainly from the time I've started working, it has been focusing on the issues of the, of the poor and of rural India. I will also, while I speak, have a slideshow because um, through my 15 minutes and the slideshow begins actually with taking me right back to this, what Anuli talked about, moving from Sumeru house uh, towards what you see on the right of your screen in just one second, we're just in the sharing here. What you see on the right of the screen is the village hut, do you see it? I think. Uh, is the village hut where I have moved in a village called Devdungri, tiny little village with 40 homes, um, moved in 1987, along with two colleagues of mine who you see on my right and left. Um, I mean, uh, to my right, Aruna Roy and Shankar Singh. That hut which you saw was, is Shankar's sister's house and she moved to her field. So it's a tiny little hut with, I think the amount of time, amount of space that in where, where two beds were is the amount of space where our rooms were. And since 1987, that has been our home and place from where we have worked. Aruna used to be a civil servant who served for seven years, resigned, and then started working in rural Rajasthan. And Shankar is a fabulous communicator. Um, sometime, Later, some of you we will, I, I hope, will be able to see some of the communication things that he's done. But those are the first two people I started working with. Here you see a whole range of a small segment of many, many, many people who make up the MKSS. The MKSS is a Mazdoor Kisan Shakti Sangatan. It is an organization of peasants and workers. It is not funded. And therefore, many people amongst even my classmates, I'm sure, will see NGOs and civil society as just one group, whereas it is a huge range. In fact, the term NGO or civil society does not define very well what it is. We are a non-funded organization. And all these people who you see are amongst a small segment of many, many more who have contributed over 30 years without funds. In our organization, there are now 10 to 15 people who take minimum wages as a salary. So when I started in 1987, I lived in that hut for 11 rupees a day was our salary because that was the minimum wage. Today, the minimum wage is 225 rupees per day. That is still our wage for everyone. And often one thinks that even NGOs, for the, them to be effective on a large scale, you need huge amounts of money from foundations, which we don't take from government, which we don't take. But actually, because of our campaigns, today we have something like the NREGA, which gives one lakh crores. That is the amount of money that today NREJ has sanctioned for being done or RTI. And what is basically the concept of RTI? So Sushila, one of the people you saw on the last screen, when RTI was started, it was basically four words. Hamara pesa, hamara hisab. We are asking, it's our money and it's our accounts. So people working on public works were not getting even that 11 rupee minimum wage. And they said, why are we not getting it? And the answer came, well, it's in the records. They said, can we see those records so that we can get our wage, minimum wage? And they said, no, these are secret under the Official Secrets Act because they are bills and vouchers. So we live under that colonial hangover where we cannot see what is, what is actually ours. And Sushila, in a 1996, after a 40-day dharna, in where we sit in in a town called Biawar came to Delhi and in Delhi she 
in the former prime minister vp saying and there were many judges present in the room after that dharna and they asked her what do you a village woman how much have you studied she said only till fourth class so what do you have to do with something like rti and she said what you see on the screen when i send my son to the market with 10 rupees i ask him for accounts ki aapne chai ki patti ya namak ya jo bhi liya wapas kya hisab hai the government spends billions of rupees in my name it's our money it's our accounts hamara paisa hamara hisab so in four words it's a big challenge for me to speak in 15 minutes but in four words she defined the essence of the rti and that essence of the rti from this house this is the inside of that photo that you saw the inside part this is a chabutra where we sit and sitting in places like this a small group of people can make a huge difference so i come to you today to talk about citizenship i come to you today to talk about the country that is india its great constitution the democratic spaces that are there to be protected and to tell you that very ordinary people can do a lot so why can't all of us do a lot campaigns were run relentlessly from 1990 till to, till the year 2000 when rajasthan passed a right to information act there were we were on truck yatras through the state we were walking on yatras we were sitting in sitins like this of this kind we were campaigning this is in the capital city of jaipur between 1996 and 2005 we must have had 20 such sitins where near the secretariat we were saying we want to see what's happening in our name in the secretariat and we were simultaneously also asking for a national rural employment guarantee act because people were not simply asking for rti or information for the sake of information it was related to their employment to their labor to their wages and like hamara paisa hamara hisab our money our accounts there was another slogan that the, that slogan was the hum har haath ko kaam do kaam ka pura daam do give work to every hand and give work full wage to every labor now that's something you i everyone who studies our children everyone wants they want work and they want a just reward for their work so the demand for an employment guarantee act went through in little little villages as you see on the left in, in hundreds of meetings across the state and country campaign is not run by one person it's not run just by a small group it's initiated like that but it spreads if it really is something meaningful and then you have something like an employment guarantee law which guarantees 100 days work to any rural citizen at minimum wages within 15 days this is the first public hearing because this is another very important part of what what took place and in these this is quite interestingly the first public hearing in 1994 where we got access to records and read it out that public hearing took place and this is another hearing where we are talking about democracy with transparency and accountability to the people the tent people were scared because everyone attacked us because we were showing records so the tent people ran away and one Foji, who was in that particular village called Port Kirana, he pulled out his parachute that he had brought when he had retired, and he put that up, and he said, "I will put my tent." And the young kids of the village came and said, "This is our money and our accounts. We will protect you from any attacks that were taking place because it was very early days in our work." So it comes with a lot of threats, you know, all across, but it comes with people who will also support you. Finally, we got a law. the right to information act 2005 this is the gazette which took from 1990 to 2005 15 years of relentless campaigning completely peaceful by ordinary people what i want to say here is that whether it is public audits which is allowed through because happens possible because of right to information where you and i as citizens can get out the information and can actually hold the government to account and these are the little little places in which those can take place in millions of places and it's part of the law and information itself many people cannot reach today on the net i'll come back to you later today and show you some things but on the net you can't reach but you can paint that information of that village from the net if you take it and it's accessible onto a wall and this is on a little shrine nreg has 10 crore workers but you see here this on this one wall where part of the rti act says proactively disclose information without it even it being asked 
Here are the names of the people who have worked, how many their, their job card numbers are, how many days they've worked and how much they've earned. So if you get a name like Keshi Devi and you know that Keshi Devi is actually in Mumbai and not in her village, you can hold them to account. So this is an idea of how these can go right across the country. What I want to talk about now very briefly is what is citizenship? What makes India? What makes India is this great constitution we gave ourselves. We, the people of India, all you, I, all of us, I certainly learned this preamble when I was in school in the civics class. I don't think I ever understood how important it is that we, the people of India, having solemnly resolved to constitute India into a sovereign democratic republic, justice, social, economic, political, liberty of thought, expression, belief, faith, and worship, equality of status and opportunity, and fraternity assuring the dignity of the individual, very problematic together today, and the unity of the nation. That's the idea of India. And if that is threatened, I want to come to today in citizenship. One idea of citizenship is that what the constitution gives us. And the other is that we are asking communities to prove their citizenship and making particularly communities threatened. So we know the, the Citizenship Amendment Act has completely set fire across the country. This is the famous shine bug thing. My colleague Aruna is speaking. I'm there with a small camera. And look at the symbols of the people. The Muslim community, very scared. Look at the symbols they brought. The Indian flag in the center. Gandhiji, Maulana Azad, Dr. Ambedkar. These are the symbols, Chandrasekhar Azad saying, this is the India we want. And that's the India I am also appealing to all of us that we should try and build and stand by. Another part of what we are now facing today is what we have seen after COVID. One part is what COVID does to all of us. Other part is what we've done through our policies like a four hour notice for lockdown. We all saw these scenes on our videos. We'll talk about it a little bit more. NREJ is one of the things that has saved us from that. Millions of people with no space available at all, with no social distancing available at all, walking, look at this symbol. These are people walking with all that they have on their heads and with kids in their arms, hundreds of miles. And if you and I cannot reach out to say that these are fellow citizens, equal citizens, what we have, we must share. What privilege we have, we must share. They will share with us a battle for an equal India, for a just India, for an India according to the preamble and constitution. These are not people who want anything more than what you and I want. Many of our classmates are abroad and have had to come back, have had to travel from one part of the country to the other. These are people who are the backbone of the Indian economy. They travel to work and they were given four hours and then locked down and locked out. And even today, they are in dire straits. If we are in dire straits in the economy, they are even more in dire straits. So I would like to end with this image and come back to actually a few images a little bit later today after when, when Anuli has uh, spoken to me briefly. And Anuli and I will have a chat. So I think... We'll take this image off and I may come back to show two or three more images when Anuli asked me about RTI and NREGA in a little more detail. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nikhil. Um, that was uh, extremely insightful and as I predicted, energizing as well. Um, I'd like to get to the first question. Uh, and that I'm coming, I'd like to bring it to the present context from the first question. Uh, RTI is a powerful act, uh, which was a result of a grassroots movement. Uh, we saw exceptional mobilization at that time. And um, I just want to understand, can we do that today? Do we have that freedom today? And what is the status of people's movements? RTI was an extraordinary people's movement. It is an extraordinary people's movement. Actually, one very interesting statistic, uh, and I'll show this, this to you on the screen actually again, is that today there are six to eight million people who use the, use the Right to Information Act. So again, when I said a small group of people can start and do something that can lead to... Uh, something very, very huge. The point is when RTI began, we began with these little, little public hearings. And then it grew into a movement. And 
today when you say that the atmosphere is really against us last year they tried to amend the rti act but these 6 to 8 million people all of them without knowing anyone or the other a part of a movement because it's like a river it's something all of us want and it's not that we are driven by anyone else or anyone else's money we are driven from within for some cause that we all similarly believe in so those are those 6 to 8 million people one rti application actually shakes up an office we've seen it it as soon as it goes there it's as if they're catching a hot plate they leave it their hands leave it and then immediately there's a meeting saying what to do an rti has come what to do an rti has come because they have to reveal the truth and an ordinary indian citizen can ask the president of india's office the prime minister's office uh, the the judges in the supreme court any office or their panchayat or sarpanch okay so on that note could you give us some instances where uh, you know some instances of rti cases which you felt uh, it was worth it you know the whole movement was yeah. worth it so i i will tell you firstly um if you look if you the very first application of the after the rti act was passed was when we sat in that same place where we had sat in that on the night 1996 we came back to that same market place where today by the way there's a memorial to the rti it's not a memorial to a human being it's not a memorial to the mkss there's a memorial from the city of bihar to the right to information act and there in that market place chang gate the first person who came up to us and said what are you doing we say we said we are sitting here to file rti applications rti came into effect 5 minutes ago he said well i haven't got my rations for one year and i'm extremely poor his name was kani baba we filed that rti application and the next day the ration dealer went to his house with sacks of grain to say please take your rations so from a kani baba whose food security depends on rti to these 6 to 8 million people to actually what i will go you saw painted on the walls the information this is something that has come up a year ago jan suchna portal which is all the information it you can see 44 departments 78 schemes 219 sub schemes that information is proactively available without asking for it as soon as it comes online the rest of government hides it we have managed to force it open and if you can see down below the visitor counter is that 18 lakh people have accessed this in one year that means that many people had information interest and 2 crore 70 69 lakh bits of information have been taken so that's how technology can be used to hide and technology can be used to give and people who are from the rti movement push to get it so like one kani baba everyone can see when ration was taken in their name in real time through this they can see when pensions were taken in their name in real time so those are the kinds of stories yeah that's truly a revolution i'm going to shift to uh, another um, legislation that uh, mkss was behind and that's the mahatma gandhi national rural, rural employment guarantee act uh, narega as many of us know it uh, it has become extremely relevant in connection with the current migrant crisis uh, why is it that Narega is the only safety net when the reality is that we need so much more. In fact, 70 years since we got independence, and uh, we're still fighting for the right to food. Uh, where are we failing? So, Anuli, this is a great question at this time. Actually, right to food, which you mentioned, and Narega are the only two things that are saving millions of Indians' lives. And both these legislations again were part of which many many people's movements and people were involved with. And where I want to reach out to people from schools like Labdale is if ordinary people can fight for years to get this kind of legislation. Look at the power that people like you and I have, Anuli. You through your magazine mm-hmm. and the work that you do, what I do because of my language. I speak in English. I'm from a class that is influential. And people like us say we can't do anything. well we owe it to our people we owe it for the privilege of our education we owe it for what we have narega today with all its problems during april 2020 38 lakh new job cards were made that means 38 lakh people who went back home from their 
from those migrant labor for whom we all cried we and we if we went to a foundation how many would we help a thousand two thousand three thousand but if we make it part of our legal framework we can help this kind of number and this is still not not enough there was a 6.5 increase of in in man days even though there was no work in the month of april because everything was locked down one and a half crore people were who demanded work have not got it that's where you and i can help a lot all of us can help to make sure our laws work even better so these are some of the statistics that and it's so huge that one out of every third rural household has worked today we need an urban employment guarantee act we need much more money in narega and narega is not enough you're absolutely right we need an employment guarantee america during the great depression had a new deal where roosevelt said we will give anyone who wants work artists can art, paint singers can sing people can build roads and that's what was changing a challenge into an opportunity to say the state will make sure no one starves they will get work and they will get it at minimum wages why can't we do that all of us if we put it together we can make sure that narega is not just narega but it is a it is a disaster management employment guarantee that gives everyone who needs work you again our class is facing beginning to face the economic downturn problems we have a opportunity to try and make sure that nobody starves and already uh, the there are estimates from un bodies that about 15 million households have gone below the poverty line we will pay for years we said we are a country with a lot of resources we need to put those resources for our poorest people absolutely absolutely i think there's going to be extremely challenging times ahead uh, post the lockdown and uh, i don't know whenever the covid situation stabilizes um so this is a topic that's quite close to um, me which is um, activism activism is under siege uh, writers academicians uh, activists uh, they're being targeted and arrested as someone who is on the radar and i would even say on the front line uh, can you explain to us uh, you know i want i want you to connect us to this issue how important an activist is in our lives and what they do for us you know in, in just yeah i just want a connection i do I, i just don't want people to dismiss this dangerous trend absolutely anuli thank you for asking this question and i have been reading what you've been writing and thank you for raising those issues also in your writings uh today even the media is not raising these issues and i don't say it because i am an activist i say it because i know how many of our my fellow activists rti for instance more than 90 people have lost their lives for just asking questions if we do not understand that the activists today are not seeking public office they are trying to get whatever they can get best out of out of this entire structure and system not just for themselves but for the entire country for everyone the people who fought for the rti did not go back and get become rich aff and affluent immediately they fought for everyone even ordinary people they face the biggest brunt but there are many activists today being sent to jail some who you've written about they are being just called urban naxals what is that term they it's a term that was used for us just completely loosely and we want to ask those people and shake them up and say what do you mean what have we done we've never lifted a single you can just brand someone and then the state can take that branding and put you away and today it's us like in hitlerian germany tomorrow it will be everyone one after the other it will be one community because if you keep looking for enemies and keep stopping people who will raise questions you may not like those questions that's what a democracy is answer those questions answer them in public domain and do not use and misuse power and the law against activists because it will close off all our spaces i don't expect everyone in the audience today to agree with me at all i don't expect that but i do expect like we have said just now with prashant bhushan when we said we send us also to jail if you want to send him to jail that we will protect his right to say what he has to say till our death that famous quote which is ascribed to voltaire is something all of us must do and that's what the activist does but i want to understand also what is the fear what what are they frightened of what can someone like um, you know arun parera do for instance what, what is the big threat 
Yeah, so these are such innocent people, in a sense, such good people who've gone out and lived in villages. Mm -hmm. They have gone out and done the best. You could. You should go there and talk to people, the kind of work that they have done with people, most of these, these people. Mm -hmm. And yes, you may not agree with their views, but just because you want to make a target, just because you want to change the narrative, today in Delhi, people who are being targeted the riots were being instigated by one set of people, those who were saying, and that's why I showed those CAA slides, that those who were, the, the Muslim women were coming out with the best symbols, national symbols, educating their own people about what the nation should be. We should be supporting those people. If we turn them into demons for our own narrow political gains, mm. and this is the problem that when you connect politics with a community, when you connect politics with a religion, it's a very dangerous mix. Oh, and then you will find targets and you will put anything you want against those people. And that's why our constitution and those lovely concepts in that preamble have to be protected. And that's what our role as ordinary citizens is, to understand the truth. Don't believe what's being put out, reach behind it, understand the truth. And on the basis of that, not one of them have lifted a gun ever in their lives. How can they be called Maoists? Mm -hmm. Not one of these people have been doing anything with riots. How can they, people like Harsh Mandar, people like Apurvanand, people like Yogi and the other, they've, we've seen them day in and day out. And what exactly. all the Rahul Roy, they've been saying, don't have violence, stop violence. But they Who speak, are we targeting? They speak truth to power. So that's the bottom yeah, line. So, that's a very important, important <laughs> uh, issue in thought. Yeah. Um, so, so while we're on that, I just want to say that uh, so much of what we know of India is being uh, dismantled, uh, unnecessary tampering of legislation. In fact, the RTI was also, they tried tamp uh, they amended it last year, I think. Uh, what has happened to this nation where the bedrocks of democracy, such as freedom of speech and expression are being eroded? I mean, where are we going? Yeah. So, you know, Anuli, firstly, it's an interesting irony that the government that passed the RTI tried to amend it within one year. So that's the nature of people in power. And that's another, another hallmark of the activists that they are watchdogs. Mm -hmm. Their job is to watch. And that's why they come under so much attack, because nobody wants to be watched. Nobody wants to be held to account. But that's what activists are doing. But the laws themselves, today what we are seeing is actually democracy under threat, the freedom of expression under threat. Uh, one of the most important freedoms in all our fundamental rights is if we can't speak, we can't fight for any other right. Mm -hmm. And that you, you won't have a job or you'll have a job that's useless. And uh, many of us won't have a life because we'll have a life that as soon as anything we do makes anyone in power uncomfortable, they'll tell us to shut up or they'll put us in jail. We don't want that kind of country. We have fought for a country, lots of our people and the poor the most, because what gives them except the freedom of expression, the right to speak. So these legislations are now being brought in with zero public consultation, environmental impact assessment, no, almost no public consultation at a time and parliament did not even sit. We did a Janta parliament just now because parliament did not sit for five months. So our various means by which we can do some kind of public monitoring are all being removed. Laws are being thrust through. Big, big effect on, on our country. Can you imagine if we don't have people giving an impact assessment of environment, what will happen commun to communities, whether in Kodakanal or in Himachal or in Jammu and Kashmir or in Ladakh, industry without in, in, environment impact assessment of the people themselves. So what we are fighting for is people. What we are fighting for is the views of people because they know best that's what a democracy is. And okay. to have laws which don't respect people is a problem. Absolutely, yeah. Which brings me to the question of Nikhil, not all of us can do what you do. So uh, one of the reasons we have you on this panel is to also uh, explain to us what, what would make us better citizens? Um, uh, what can the schools do? What can we do as parents uh, just to guide them? You know, there's, I just feel there's a whole generation growing up with a lot of fear. We didn't have that. Yeah. So give us some pointers yeah. over here. <laughs> so I'm going to say one or two things that are very obvious and one or two that are obvious, but maybe unpalatable. Um, I mean, one or two that are obvious is that 
I what I have done is nothing extraordinary. Okay. I was not a brilliant student who stood first in school, even though I think our batch had many second, fifth, eighth, I don't know what, many, many kind of ranks in the country. Yeah. I was not great in sports. I could not sing for nuts. But what I can do just requires what I do. And there are many better people than me. Just requires compassion and commitment. That's what all of us have. So if any of us sitting wherever we are can display some of that, we are people of privilege. We can have a much bigger voice and impact. We owe it because of the kind of privilege education we have had, because of the access we've had, because of the money we have, we owe it to people. Today, if any of you were to visit me and I welcome you to do that, I'll take you to some homes around where you will see how different, how much inequality there is in India. Even during this period of, of this economic collapse, how much richer some people have got, how much more? and how much poorer are some others. I would urge all of you to look at the Oxfam inequality report of the world and see what India is happening, what's happening in India. So what should we do? At least two things, I think, that this is what we've talked about when we, when we want to say that all our legislation of rights-based and a welfare state is that we must guarantee that any child born in this country will get equal access to education and health. That's something that all of us had a very privileged education. I think there is no way that when I went and stood with Shankar and said, you and I will get into some kind of equal competition, there's any quality in that. Because I had access to everything and he had access to nothing, although both of us went to school. So I think that's something that we need to fight for, a equal access to two. Today in COVID, can you imagine, we are so worried but the entire private hospital system is fleeced everyone. So we have to have fight for a state that will give equal access to education and health. And that is something that doesn't come easily from people like us in our own class, because we immediately look to see what will we get for ourselves. But if we want to really do something, these are two things, even in countries around the world, all across Europe, even in America, it's a fundamental issue. So I think that's a fundamental issue we must agree on. I don't think people will necessarily agree on, but we must fight for that the education our kids are getting, think about the education. We had a big campaign called Shiksha Ka Sawal, where we saw there, were, there was a girls' school not very far from us, 700 girls, high school, three teachers, three teachers in all. Can they study? Can they learn? Can they have any chance in life? So should we not be fighting for them to make sure that they get minimum free equal access to education? Oh, yes. Thank you for that, Mikhail. I have a couple more questions before I uh, open the floor. Uh, just a few days ago, and I think um, Sunday, no, I think Sunday, uh, you're launching the book, We the People, edited by you and uh, your colleagues, Aruna Roy and Rakshita Swami. Um, what perspective does this collection of essays uh, have on what can be done for establishing rights and deepening democracy, as the title yeah. suggests? So yeah. I know this I, is very close to you, so you... <laughs> yeah, so thanks a lot. Actually, it's, yeah, it's interesting timing and it's We the People and this talk was also mm -hmm. We the People. Uh, and the time of year, Independence Day mm -hmm. month, which we are having is about We the People, I hope. Uh, so. It's, an, it's a collection of essays, um, and it's in a series about rethinking India. It's being brought out by Penguin, where we are the editors, Aruna and Rakshita and I are the editors. It has a series about the economy, it has on education, it has on health, uh, it has on institutions. Prashant Bhushan is one of the co-authors in one of the pieces where, and many of you will have heard of what's going on, where he talks about where judicial accountability is so important. It talks about methods of accountability like social audit for the ordinary person. Um, so it is a range of essays which says that the rights-based approach, which gave control not to a bureaucrat, not to a politician, but to the ordinary person, that it establishes that these are your entitlements that those came from large campaigns and very, very powerful ideas. And we had a series of rights-based laws, the RTI, the NREGA, the Street Vendors Act, 
the right to food act which gave access to health in fact you had asked about it, the right to food and you know we have some 80 million tons of food grain rotting mm. and we have millions of people hungry why are we not universalizing our public distribution system why are we letting that food grain rot and why are people in places like lorden school and their their alumni not fighting every single day to say do not let a single person go hungry we must have a universal public distribution system so these are the ideas in that book and they talk about them before the nrj or rti act came in people used to laugh at us what is this idea how can it come about but today those are the legislations that are actually saving this country they are saving people from hunger the nrj the right to food act is saving from hunger from unemployment rank unemployment where you'll go into starvation so these are ideas in that book uh, i don't know how many would would get around to reading it but something in this talk which i've given and been given an opportunity i speak not on behalf of myself but of millions of other these ideas are also taken from people because common sense comes from people and they have that common sense and um, i look forward to the launch of the book and uh, yeah lots of well known writers so i'm sure it'll be yeah we'll yeah. circulate on, on maybe the ol list so we will so before i wrap up my uh, my last question is uh, a school related one and uh, so i just want to circle back to your journey uh, from lovedale to uh, rajasthan uh, could you speak a little about what you got from your education in uh, lawrence that really led you down this path so <laughs> it's a question that was the most difficult in the sense when we were discussing questions to to think of and um, i i really must say two three things one is actually to tell you the truth when i was in school itself i was very interested in politics and one of the one of the things i fear you know um actually one thing i learned after after lovedale i spent two years in a kendri vidyalaya and i learned that there is a different kind of education even that is privileged but i understood how privileged lovedale was and then i went and spent my 12th grade in the us where i understood yet another kind of schooling and college but there i made friends with some feminists who who taught me this slogan firstly they taught me this power of feminism which i think Uh, a lot of us now need to do but the slogan that the personal is political i just want to say to many kinds of people who will be listening today often we give think politics is a bad word but it determines how we will relate with everything and how the country will run in lovedale i understood that actually looking back in many ways and one thing that the school gave me is a sense of confidence to be able to deal with anything and it did actually give me an idea that you must stand with the underdog that's what took me to where i went to the, amongst the poorest people and have gained so much from them because i realized how rich their lives are and how powerful their solidarities are and how much they do towards contributing to change mm-hmm. so i think those were the biggest ideas not what i learned in terms of books which i would have learned anywhere but in terms of that uh there is you have to be able to stand up with confidence for your ideas and yeah. those ideas i hope the i don't think the idea of a public school it's a misnomer is a great okay. idea frankly but it did give me some things that and i some day will have a debate uh, yeah. because there are many things in that form of education that need to be questioned uh but there are many things that that community has given and i hope the community i can reach out to them to give much more I'm, i'm i'm sure you can and uh, i have to say we're very proud that uh, you're part of the alumni um, i'm sure you know all of us will take away something from this talk um, i know that we can do a whole session on your uh, opinion on schools and education but we'll leave that for another time i'm going to take one question from there are two questions right now one is from rajneesh dhal so here goes why would the government not allocate further resources to the migrant crisis either by increasing the minimum wage adding allocations to narega etc isn't it in their interest some of the recent measures have been more focused on the lending side but why not just raise narega wages do direct benefit transfers is it a cost issue or something else 
it's a competing priorities issue. I think it's very foolish policy because even the market will not run unless there is demand. If demand can only come when you put money in people's hands. That's something that's basic economics as far as I can understand. None of the products are going to sell. The market is not going to move. And therefore, absolutely, uh, there needs to be a pumping in of money, which countries around the world have done 10% of GDP. We claim to have done 10%, but actually, absolutely, as the question says, it's all on the lending side. That's no good. We've already had a huge set of experiences with lending and there's no point lending to produce when you can't buy it. So you need to get people to be able to earn enough, survive enough, put money in the market and therefore it needs for Narega and other things. There are other ways in which more money can be put in and it needs on the urban and the rural side. So I think it's very foolish policy, but it's being done in part because uh, there is a framework that says no, only when you help industry and even the helping of industry is that only when you don't let a deficit come in uh, will you be able to run your economy. But this is perilous times. And these are times in which you will have to do deficit financing and you will have to get people. You have to first feed your people. You have to first make them at, put them back at work. And those are that that is an important question. So, so we have time for just one more question. Uh, it's from Zareer Bhatliwala. He says, uh, do you see an Urban Employment Guarantee Act at any time soon? Yeah, so there are, I think that there will be lip service paid to an Urban Employment Guarantee Act and there are noises in that direction. I only hope, like when we fought for the Rural Employment Guarantee Act, the first thing that the entire government machinery did was completely whittle it down into nothingness. It's only actually through parliamentary lobbying and advocacy and dharnas and andolans that it came back to make it a real guarantee of 100 days work. I hope the urban employment guarantee is a real guarantee. And it, it can absolutely revive again the industry. It can actually make our cities much more better, have green works, do all kinds of things. But it needs I, the people listening together today, if they put their voice behind it, I know it will amplify much more because otherwise voices like ours are just dispelled by saying, oh, you only want to spend government money. You don't really want to have, you know, real economic growth, but economic growth is not going to come unless the workers who we have really mistreated over the last few months are given some minimum guarantees, both of work and of wages and of living working conditions. And that'll, that needs government intervention. Okay. in a positive direction. I think there can also be a whole session on economic growth, but uh, we'll save that for another time. It doesn't can... exist in our preamble <laughs> or in our constitution anywhere, and that's the only thing mantra we talk about. So we need <laughs> to talk about many other kinds of humanitarian growth and humanitarian values which are there in our constitution. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I look forward to... Um, many more uh, conversations, Nikhil. This has just been a wonderful opportunity. And um, I'm gonna hand it over to Kalpana because I can see that uh, time is She's running low. <laughs> She's come on. So uh, thank you once again. This has just been uh, absolutely wonderfully engaging. Kalpana, so Anuli and Nik yeah. Anuli Kalpana. and Nikhil, thank you both very much. That was truly inspirational and very, very informative. Um, Nikhil, if you had to leave us with, in 15 seconds, if you had to leave us with a um, a phrase to ponder upon, what might that be? So I'm going to take a phrase from earlier. Anuli talked about you have to speak truth to power. Mm -hmm. India's democracy is very much under threat and attack. I would expand that a little from a South African poet called Jeremy Cronin, who was part in jail from the Communist Party of South Africa, who after 10 years of democracy in South Africa said, we have to speak truth to power. We have to make power truthful and we have to make truth powerful. So I'd like everyone to ponder on all Very three. Nice. And Very nice. that's all that's time really nice. that. Thank you very, very much. Truly appreciate it. Much gratitude. Thank you. And with that, I'll pass it on to Rohan for the next session. Thank you. Thank you, Nikhil. Thank you, Anuli. And thanks again, uh, Kalpana. And uh, now we have uh, president of the Old Laurentian Association, Mr. Johnny Paul. He's going to say a few words, and he will be joined in a few seconds by 
the headmaster of Lawrence School of Bale, Mr. Prabhakaran Nair. I just want to talk about uh, uh, an incident a few years, uh, many years ago, a Scandinavian friend of mine, a uh, business party wanted to come to India for the first time and he said, what can we expect? Do you speak Indian? I said, well, sorry? Do you speak Indian? I said, there's no such language called Indian. So, okay, what can I expect? I said, I can guarantee you what you will expect is a sensory overload. And that's what we are, a hustling, bustling, boisterous democracy, uh, whatever you want to call it, but you know, we, we are a live nation and we are evolving. But for me, Lovedale taught me that we are one. And with that, I hand you hand over to Johnny Paul. Johnny, over to you. Hi, good evening friends. And welcome to the third edition of the Oil Nation presented to you from, by the Old Laurentian Association. You've just heard Nickel. And you know what I was reminded of was our school motto, never give in. So let me thank this extremely dedicated uh, team for organizing these events. The last episode alone has had an overwhelming 16,000 plus views. There's no doubt that this is a wonderful way to bring our fraternity together. Our strength will come from our integration across batches, professions, cities and nations. I understand there are over 2,000 old Laurentians globally who have their profiles and are active on LinkedIn. We invite you to please join the Old Laurentian Association's official LinkedIn group and share aspects of your careers and professional lives. I would like to take this opportunity to let you know that the OLA is embracing all possible methods to strengthen our bonds. And social media is an important part of this. To this effect, we have stepped in and have improved our presence. We have a team of OLs working together to combine various loosely formed groups under one umbrella. We welcome your suggestion on how we may best use these resources. It will include job postings, sharing of original articles and content, career stories and the like. In case you want help in setting up your profile and pages, please do let us know. We have all volunteers who will be glad to help you. In, importantly, we have also launched the Laurentian Marketplace on Facebook under the Old Laurentian Facebook group and page. We encourage all of you to sign on and introduce yourselves with a brief on your business, products or service offerings. This is exclusively for the OLs and we hope to have special offers too. You may also make special requests for advice on any profession, professional career, business concepts or ideas and invite comments. Just to be clear, we are purely facilitating a dialogue between OILs for commercial purposes and have no involvement in these transactions. Special offers and the like may be sent to the OLA administrator, administrator who will ensure that they are curated and placed properly on the group. I hope you all enjoy the event and get more involved in the activities of your association. Now, I'll once again introduce you to the headmaster of our beloved school, Mr. Prabhakar Nair. Welcome, sir. Good evening. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for giving me another opportunity to talk to all of you. Uh, third session of uh, OIL Nation. Uh, in fact, a lot of positive feedback from my students and staff. And uh, today, before I speak to you, I had a very inspiring session by one of the OIL, Mr. Nikhil Day. I'm a bit confused after listening to such a, uh, a great, uh, inspiring talk. What am I going to tell you? Nothing much. Okay. No, uh, man, I just, can I just introduce you? So, yes. so everyone else, okay. See, we have had a long and distinguished, you had a long and distinguished career for over a quarter of a century at Dune, uh, who have, have a distinguished alumni body with this great experience. Now as a leader at Lawrence School Lovedale, a 162-year-old organization and institution close to your heart, to our hearts, what do you think of the OIL, OLA's present activities 
and how can we further enhance the profile and stature of our own school and improve our relationships with you and your wonderful team. Thank you very much. Um, of course, um, I have been into education for 34 years and all 34 years is with uh, um, in a boarding school only. Okay. Uh, so uh, the heart and soul of a boarding school, I know it, I was a part of it. So here, uh, the, the most important thing is that, you know, as it is, if you if, if I look at it, all oil community has been very supportive and helpful to the school. In fact, um, school is, uh, is is something uh, very close to their heart. They may agree, disagree. They have their own opinion. They may criticize, but when it comes to the school, it is their heart and soul, and they're very sentimental about it. They all come and they speak highly about it. Their memories are very deep, so that's there. And when I look at what I can do, for example, what Laurentians can do. I'm already doing it. I have a lot of oil, um, uh, you know, members in the board. Very often, they they give us a lot of guidance and support, uh, moral as well as uh, um, you know practical support they give. And I also have a couple of colleagues like Mr. Arjun Rao, who is listening to me. We worked together in Dune, and Mohit Sinha is one of the oil. I worked with the oil uh, as some of the oil worked with as colleagues. And uh, most important thing, I just want to bring it here is a trust. For example, when you talk about school, 162 years, one of the oldest uh, school, legacy school in the country. Uh, at the same time, uh, there are a lot of things over a period of time have changed. Again, I don't use the word change, we have to change, but we have to adapt and evolve. Uh, according to 21st century, there are a lot of things need to be updated and, and evolved. That I'm doing it for the betterment of the school. At the same time, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We don't have to reinvent the school. It's a time tested. It's going on pretty well. Uh, so those uh, issues uh, with reference to uh, discipline, with reference to various other infrastructural uh, development, it's very, very important that we work for the uh, betterment of the school and uh, I need your support and trust. Uh, definitely, the heart and soul of the school will remain intact, but we have to evolve according to 21st century. At the end of it, we are preparing children for tomorrow. So that trust. And second thing is, I'll put it very crisp because there are a lot of, uh, uh, you know, eminent people there to talk. I don't want to take out their time. Second is the communication. One of the most important aspects in today's world is the revolution of communication. Uh, you know, you have hundreds and thousands of uh, information link. Uh, a lot of thing comes in, in public platforms, public domain and all. So whatever the school is doing, whatever way we are taking decision, most of it comes in the website. And in case if you have anything, you can ask me, contact me directly. I'm in touch with the president of oil. There are a lot of oil members in the board. They're, they're in touch with us. We work very closely. So all those information, very official information will come to you. Do not get carried away by messages which you get from these WhatsApp universities and you know various other social networking sites. That is, is more of a, of a confusion than that of getting any clear cut message. That is one request. Another thing is what OILs are doing at the moment. They have been great support to the school. Then. I cannot always depend on oil community for running the school because I have a team with me, bursa, deputy headmaster, teacher, support staff, and my job is to, to work the school you know, the, in a self-reliant way. We have to generate our own resources, work independently, and maintain a certain level of financial as well as various uh, you know, educational balance so that we work perfectly. Then, whenever there is an issue, whenever there is support needed, I always, I always approach the OILs and they are more than happy to help me. And there, I have, I have, I'm very grateful to the oil community. As far as the interaction with school and oil is concerned, it's very positive, especially, you know, I have taken over for the past two years. Right from the beginning, I'm in touch with uh, Mr. Johnny Paul and various other oil, uh, you know, responsible um, lead, uh, oil, um, you know, those office bearers, Rohan, and uh, various other members. Plus, uh, there are very, very responsible people there in the um, governing body. Uh, board of governors or also OILs, and they also give a lot of positive support. So there is nothing much as such. Only two things, make the communication direct and clear so that we can avoid the confusion. And second thing is the trust that you know, I'm here. Uh, my job is to take care of the school. I'm basically a caretaker and add value to the system, whichever, whatever way I can, and take the team with me. And it's a, it's a very, very good uh, teamwork with OIL and management going on. Let's continue with that. And the last is, Presently, this oil knowledge sharing, we have taken it uh, to a great, um, uh, with a great interest and it's going on well. This 
uh, this, this particular platform with oil, oil national and all has been well received. This is also adding another opportunity of learning to a large number of students and staff. Keep doing it and uh, let's work together. And uh, of course, the institution is great and everything what we do will strengthen the institutional glory and let's work together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank sir. You. I have one question for Mr. Nair. Uh, there has been anecdotal evidence that certain other institutions uh, in the northern part of our country uh, yeah. have uh, been inspired by some of our programs. What is yeah. your, what yeah, is yeah. your uh, feedback on that? I also got it directly. Some of them even asked me. Uh, that gives us a great feeling that we are the leaders. Yeah. We have taken the lead and bait <laughs> and uh, let me the leaders. <laughs> And uh, it's a great thing. It's a very, uh, very, very good information. And it is true also. And a lot of people are taking it up. Why not? The best practices can be shared. Absolutely. And, absolutely. And we are the leaders in doing best practices. Keep, keep it up. Thank you for the team. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Prabhakar. And we hope to see you again uh, next month. Of course, we have OL Assembly coming along uh, in, a, in, in two weeks' time, followed by uh, September 26th session of um, OL Nation, which is session four. And we have Kalpana back again. Kalpana, welcome once more. And I hand over to you to take you on to the next team. Thank you very much, Rohan. Um, for our next session, we have Senthil Chengalvarayan, Arvali House batch of 1981, who will moderate the second session called Life, a tapestry that unfolds as you weave with Saz Agarwal, Pankaj House, batch of 1977. In his awe-inspiring career, Sentel has served as the editor-in-chief of Network 18's business newsroom. In this role, Sentel headed a host of verticals that were integral to the group's business media ecosystem. They included CNBC, CNBC, Avaaz, TV18, and Forbes India. Prior to this, Sentel was the managing editor of CNBC TV18 a service he helped start as its editor in 1999. As a pioneer of business television in India, he led a team of journalists that made CNBC TV 18 the most successful media network in the country. Senthil stepped away from active journalism in 2015, but continues to be an invited speaker for several industry seminars. He was voted as one of India's top five English news anchors by Hindustan Times C4 survey in 2005. It was the first business anchor to be included in that list. He's also a recipient of the Young Achiever Award for the Indo-US Business Com Council. A graduate of economics from Madras University, he has done his master's in journalism from the Times Research Foundation Institute's School of Social Journalism in New, New Delhi. Sento, please unmute your mic and take it away. Thank you, Kalpana, uh, and uh, thank you, Nikhil and Anuli, for that absolutely powerful and inspiring session that we just had. Uh, hello, everybody. Lovely to be with all of you. Uh, working from home, it's been a bit of a drag, hasn't it? Four months, five months. Well, our next speaker, Saz Agarwal, Pankaj 1977, has been working from home for the last 30 years. So listening closely, she's going to give you a lot of tips. And she's been very productive in these uh, 30 years. Saz has uh, written over a dozen books, some of which are essential reading for students of South Asia studies in universities across the globe. She's also held over six exhibitions of art. Uh, all her paintings and uh, small pieces of sculpture have been sold out. Not just that, she's also been a professional. She worked uh, not on, a professional HR manager working from home, ran the HR uh, 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 function at a very, very flourishing software startup. And in the process, she's also raised three children. We're going to talk about all of this in a bit, but this is the Independence Day special, as uh, uh, Rohan uh, told us. And uh, some of Saz's books have been uh, dealing with a community that was directly affected by uh, independence and what happened in August 1947. Uh, I'm talking about the Sindhis. Uh, Saz, when I've spoken to older generation Punjabi families, 
right, right when I started my career in Delhi in the mid 80s, they didn't refer to what happened in August 1947 as independence, but they called it partition. For them, the pain of partition was still there. The memory of partition was searing. But you tell me that the Sindhis really thought of it as independence. What was the difference that these two communities uh, experienced? I think it might be a generational difference, but I'm not very sure. I know that when I started writing about, when I started talking about partition, I used to get these negative reactions, uh, you know, oh, don't start that again kind of thing, you know, with, because of the images of violence and the horror stories. And uh, I, I, it, it has been actually, thing, it has been seen in a silo with all these just Body, bodies, you know, corpses, trains filled with corpses and women being forced to jump into wells and things like that. Uh, but then if what, what my work has been is to look at individual stories and uh, look at it a little more closely and go kind of beyond the cliches. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, um, along the way, I actually developed my own cliche, which is that when you look at partition, you think of it as something which where the two major communities were at war with each other. But when you go to the individual level, you actually see every family I've interviewed has a story of how they were saved or they were protected by members of the other community and often at risk to their own lives. So, you know, you can also see it as a, a something where uh, the, the two communities were actually the closest. But when it comes to the Sindhis, the Sindhi, the whole story is different partly because there was much less violence in Sin, And uh, Sin uh, was never partitioned. The Hindus should actually have stayed on, but the new migrants to Sin, uh, I think partly the ones who left, they were kind of pushed out. It was greed for their property and their wealth. And when they left, they settled in other places and they lost their ancestral homeland, which means that they lost their culture as well, because there was no place on which they could actually, uh, there was no place where their language was spoken so, on the streets. So this is a community that lost its nation, that it, it lost it its entire homeland. It has no roots mm -hmm. and it's scattered. A lot of, um, a majority of the population is Bombay, also Pune, but it's a global community. Every port around the world, and that's not a new story. It's not from 1947. The, uh, the ports were populated by Sindhi traders right since 1860s, okay. since the 1860s. So those were trading posts which grew into communities after partition. What made you write, uh, start writing about this community? I know your mother is more the same. Yeah, way. so actually there's a, a small backstory to it, Senthil. I'm a writer and I actually started writing when I was very young. I had my first byline when I was seven years old uh, in the St. Hilda's uh, magazine. <laughs> So I was a writer through school. I wrote later as well. And uh, several years ago, about 2005, I actually had my first book commission, which was to work with somebody to write, uh, you know, produce his memoir. And over a period, I specialized in that. I started writing, uh, working with elderly people and helping them to write their memoirs. And that I, was something which I really enjoyed a lot. And I learned a lot from it. Um, it was um, something which is, uh, you know, you, you give somebody a space to listen. Uh, I mean, I mean, you, you listen, you give them space, yeah. and then they um, tell you stuff, and then you put it together. And it's generally, you know, it was a lot of learning also for me. Mm -hmm. And I kept doing that. I uh, began to specialize in this area, which is the early... Um, industrial history of India, which okay. is where most of my clients were coming from. They were business people and, you know, looking at um, the 50s, the second five-year plan, and uh, think, uh, then the acute foreign exchange shortage, which led to uh, manufacturing starting in India and various other things. Okay. So since I was doing that, I... Uh, uh, said to my mother, this was the time when my dad had passed away and, you know, I wanted to engage her with something meaningful. I wanted to make her feel wanted. And I, um, I said to her, why don't you tell me about your childhood in Sindh? 
-hmm. And the thing is that we never, we had never actually heard anything. It. Nobody in the family had actually spoken about Sindh, what it was like. And um, was, that, was that true? Most families that had uh, come through this experience? I do feel that, uh, you know, I, uh, since I had no connection at all with sin, and I, uh, when I started interviewing people, I found that was actually quite common that, um, you know, the families didn't really talk. Very few. I mean, some did. Some nurtured the family stories. Right. But by and large, it was more a process of uh, integrating and, you know, accepting. And, and what was, was the idea to write a book from the beginning? Or was it just to talk to your mother? The idea actually was to make something for the family, a record for the family. Okay. And, you know, since I was quite experienced with doing that with a whole lot of people, I said to her, you know, let's just collect photos from whoever, you know, your cousins and, you know, we'll write, I'll write something because none of us know. So, But now uh, it's become almost a definite book. So when did that change from being just a family memoir to, a, to something that uh, <laughs> for a wider audience? It was very, it's very unexpected because, uh, as I said, it was this home thing. But when she started talking to me, I realized that this is a very big story and it's not been done and I should do it. So uh, I, um, so I talked to others. I mean, I didn't interview only her. I, it, it, it is largely it's her story. It's a story for childhood because what I was doing is I was looking at what was life in, like in Sindh just before, during, and just after partition? That was the theme that I, that I kind of expanded it to. And her story was very nice, very sweet. But I went and looked for people who had different representative experiences, read a lot, and put it together. So, so that's I, how that... Okay. So... Uh, I show you the... So, so yeah, okay. Let's show, show the book before we uh, go ahead. Yeah, so actually it's like this, uh, um, you know, domestic kind of thing because uh, the cover was done by my daughter and the book, you know, it's my mom's story and uh, I made the pages, you know. Uh, what happened is while we were talking, she said to me that our ship, they, they came, like many, they uh, came by ship from Karachi to Bombay. So she said, our ship reached Bombay and it was the 14th of November. And I was like, oh my God, this lady, 65 years later, she remembers the date and she'd never spoken about it before. So I was very moved. And I said, now we're going to have, we're just going to do this book fast and we're going to launch it on the 14th of November and give away gifts to, give, give it away as presents to her family members. And that's what we did. Least, least of all expecting, you know, even while it was in production, Diwali was around the corner and people who knew that I was uh, doing this, they bought in bulk to give as gifts instead of, um, you know, Sindhi people, um, Sindhi families, they, people bought it from me, like, you know, right then uh, to give us presents instead of Mithai. And then it was picked up by Oxford University Press in um, Pakistan and um, uh, so now it's, as you said, uh, it's in uh, libraries of universities that have so, so, South Asian... Uh, so Saad, you, you, you told us that uh, you found that while the uh, collective experience may have been uh, uh, bitter, uh, two communities uh, fighting, but at the family level, at the personal level, there were lots of stories of communities being helped out by the other community. Uh, can you tell, take us to some of those? So... Um, uh, this, I can tell you one from my book, one of my mom's uh, cousins. Uh, so actually, since one of the things that makes it different is that there wasn't much violence to start with. It, the the uh, violence built up. And then on the 6th of January, 1948, there was this focused pogrom in Karachi where Hindus were targeted and Sikhs, Hindus and Sikhs and killed. And uh, it was absolute massacre. And then the big exodus started after that. Now, one of my mom's cousins, when he was telling me his story, he told me that we had this new family who had just moved in, uh, Muhajirs. They'd come from across the new border and they were living uh, downstairs in our building. And he said that they came to us in the morning and they said, don't go out anywhere today. And there's gonna be trouble. 
So, you know, everybody was scared. They knew things were happening. So they didn't go out and the mob came to the door. And these people had come in earlier and they'd hung burqas on their washing line in the balcony. And they said to the people who came knocking on the door that, no, there are no Hindus here. So that's something that came from uh, my mom's cousin. And even my mom and her siblings, you know, they said, my grandfather would say this, that in Sindh, there was no difference between Hindus and Muslims. And when I was young, I thought that he's saying that because he's a liberal person, which he was. But then now, uh, you know, after interviewing many people, I realized that it actually was the truth. So let's uh, move on. the. Uh... The topic that you chose was that a tapestry, life, a tapestry that unfolds as you weave. That's uh, uh, interesting. It's from your own life. Why did you choose that as a subject? Yeah, it's because uh, I actually, I'll show you a few photos. I put these photos together, Santhal. So let me just run through them. I'm going to show you. So basically, you know, I um, uh, started working and, you know, things happened. Uh, a lot of my creativity came through adverse circumstances. And um, I just did what I thought. I mean, I worked very hard. I did what I thought was right. And then I saw amazing things happen. Uh, like um, the synth thing, like I told you, it was this domestic thing and it became an international, you know, a thing with international recognition. This is something that happened. I, I mean, my uh, big disadvantage is here, I can't read the script on this because it's Sindhi, which I don't know the language, I can vaguely understand. But I can see the date on this magazine cover, it's 2014. That was when I'd gone in March 2014, I visited Karachi. And I gave an interview to this magazine and they put me on the cover, which is awfully flattering. And then the other thing which I, yeah, so this is another thing that I wanted to share with you, which is something that I'd written. And I, I'm talking about it to this audience because this is one of the few things I've written about Lawrence and it's not at all about Lawrence actually. This is a column that I used to write for the Sunday Midday. And it was on, um, it was a parody of different writers. This one is P.G. Woodhouse. And um, uh, it's instead of Bertie Wooster, we have this person called Batty Baba and we've got Jeevan instead of Jeeves. So uh, I did this with several other writers also until at some point after about a dozen Sunday midday said, yeah, you know what, actually we're a newspaper, not, uh, you know, we don't want to do fiction. So they moved me to a book review column or something like that. <laughs> I, I was with Sunday midday for a very long time, many years. So partly coming and, you know, this is a tapestry theme again. And then, as you said, uh, I became a painter. And again, I have no idea how that happened because Again, it was creativity arising out of adversity, but I was not never somebody who could draw or anything like that in school. And this is uh, uh, something that I, I actually was planning to do it for myself, for my own home. I got this idea for um, make, you know, I, I saw this British Council calendar somewhere, which was uh, London done in the Madhubani style. So the British Council had taken a bunch of Madhubani painters to London and, um, you know, they made these pictures. And I kept thinking, oh, I want to get some Madhubani pictures of Bombay. So I made some for myself and then it just became a big thing. I had a show in Bombay and it did really well. And this went on for some years. It, it's basically, uh, you know, I used to call it Bombay cliches because uh, I'm a writer so I can, you know, have all these funky names and basically it was um, contemporary urban India done in a traditional folk style. Okay. And then I moved into another media. Uh, I'll just quickly show you the photos and then we'll get back to chatting. So this is uh, when I started working with rocks and the reason was because uh, uh, I was invited to join the Monday group. Monday is a uh, uh, is, uh, vegetable market in Pune. So this, uh, you know, they have, it's uh, this lady who started it, she asked me, will you sit with us? And I said, yes, of course. And we sit in the market and sell our products. Now, the problem is that we have to sell uh, at a low price. So uh, it has to be, you know, here I used low material cost thing, which is roadside stones. 
And then, um, so yeah, so we actually sit like this, wearing our, um, you know, clothes, the same kind of clothes as the vendors wear. And I like this photo because I look so very happy collecting money. Uh, so, you know, again, like I said about the Sindhi prejudice, maybe this is, <laughs> it's something to do with that. And yeah, so this was with discarded cassettes and um, this is also discarded cassette boxes and discarded fabrics. So this one is called Monet's Water Lilies. And, um, you know, so stuff like this. And here, yeah, I wanted to show you this because in my generation, it wasn't that. I think today's women, they are very conscious about diversity and, um, you know, being different or being not conforming. I think that that is a, a value which is supported, but maybe it wasn't that easy for us. And this is what I'm doing now, which is magnets, lockdown magnets. You, you keep you keep talking about creativity that uh, arose from diversity. Adversity. Uh, adversity, sorry. Uh, adversity. So that you know, these are difficult times. These are times when uh, people are losing jobs, people aren't talking about it, people are sitting at home. Uh, what made you start first working from home? And uh, do you have any uh, anything to, to anything that people can learn from uh, what you've gone through? Um, so when the, the when I first started writing for a living, I was a single parent with a young child, uh, three years old. And um, I just, I mean, you know, I wanted to be independent and um, I couldn't go to work because I didn't want to leave her on her own or kind of outsource the childcare. And my education was in mathematics. So giving math tuitions was something I did. It was, it, it was okay. I used to do that. But that's when I started writing again. And uh, I think when you say what, what one can learn, I think the thing is just keep trying and keep keep working. I, I can't think of anything else because that's what I did. I was just totally focused on how do I improve my situation? How do I keep, you know, come out of this? And I think in a way, when I look at the SNDs I've interviewed, I think that's what uh, drove them as well. It was just, okay, I want to get back on my feet and what do I do next? So starting to write wasn't that easy because I had to, uh, you know, I didn't have any background. I had to take what I'd written and visit the newspaper office. I used to go to the Times of India. Um, so I had met someone there and she introduced me, in fact, to the editor of Science Today, Mukul Sharma. So, you know, I wrote something for Science Today because I had a science background, so that was okay. And the Femina office was right outside. And, so I started, and it's very difficult because they keep turning you away, you know, they keep turning you away, you keep getting rejected. And I think those um, experiences of just knowing that you're nothing, knowing that you're nobody, I think those are wonderful experiences for anyone to have because you never take anything for granted then. I think that those would be the lessons that I would talk about. Okay, so uh, that'll, uh, you know, that links back to school um, as in never given <laughs> never given right so uh, uh, is that something you picked up there and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the whole uh, school in uh, overall in just a bit but was there something you picked up there or do you think this is just resilience that comes uh, to anybody going through this know. it's so hard to know because we're all everybody's different dif everybody's different so i linked it just now to the sindhi story because that's in my head at the moment I'm working I you know it's for the last few years I've interviewed so many and they've had this story everybody has this story lost everything built it all back but yeah of course it's from Lawrence that is something where I, I don't know whether it was a motto as such but maybe the environment where you were never mollycoddled you just had to do it and I think that's Great. I think it's a, you know it was very hard. It was very I was very very unhappy in school, but in a way I'm glad that you know that harsh uh, environment. I think it did. I did uh, you know make me keep going, and I think that helped. Okay, harsh, hard, but yet it taught you lessons. But yet uh, you 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 didn't send any of your children 
back to Lovedale or to boarding school? No, I'm actually somebody who was traumatized by uh, being, uh, I was in Nazareth when I was only five. And my father was a tea planter, as you know. And, uh, you know, the, at, at that time, my parents were too far from any, uh, any school. So they sent me to boarding and they, you know, they visited Nazareth. It looked really good. And it was probably a good school, but you know, everybody uh, takes to things differently. And I was extremely unhappy. It was two years of torture with a few holidays. And towards, uh, in the second half of the second year, I kept falling ill. I kept having these illnesses. My mom would come and take me home. home. And eventually, you know, they withdrew me. And then uh, my dad was transferred to a place where we, my brother and I used to commute to the same school where you were at that time. <laughs> right. Okay, we're old friends. We've known each other since, uh, well, three or four years old. All right, okay. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, so then... Um, so, was it those memories that didn't uh, want to make you put your children back to boarding or was I it the fact that you had other options? I felt very, yeah. In fact, when we... I should show you that photo, right, while we're here. Uh, sorry, just give me a second. Uh, I did feel like, um, you know, that uh, children need to be, children need a home, you know? So, okay, this is a tapestry thing. It's, it's cross-stitch. This is my family when they were, um, when we were all much younger. Mm -hmm. So it is uh, like this enormous thing with, which took me months to do. And so I didn't, uh, they were booked. I mean, the, uh, the two of them, they were booked to go to boarding school. Okay. My husband and I got married and I said no, because I feel kids, um, you know, they need, they need home, they need a home, they need, they need their parents around. And um, so that's the reason why I said no. I, 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 partly it was my trauma and I didn't want them to experience anything like that. And like sometimes now I think maybe I made a mistake, maybe I should have, you know, maybe they would have also become, you know, used to three minute baths and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> which they none of them actually do <laughs> so that's a bit annoying but yeah so uh, I wanted to also show you this okay yeah so this is uh, uh, I was looking for a photo to share about uh, you know school photo so this is your back this is your class uh, the girls of your section five girls to a section yeah, yeah. 11 C Okay. Uh, in 1977 and, and I'm the one on the right and uh, next to me is my friend Greta who lives in France, then Jyoti who lives in Uti, Anita who's a doctor in Ireland, and Annie who lives in the Gulf. And I'm, uh, you know, when I was looking at this, I remember that when I was in school, I used to be considered this fatty, this fat person. And you know, I can't see anyone over here who's fat. I just couldn't believe it. So that was one thing. The second thing is that there were five of us who were five girls in class of 32. So um, I don't want to actually get into this long whine about, you know, body shaming and gender, this and that, because actually we, you know, we had an amazing education. We were so very lucky. And whatever you can say that wasn't good in those uh, areas, most people around us had it a lot worse. So uh, I think we were really lucky. And, yeah. Yeah. But we did have a very hostile environment. There's no yeah. doubt. Well, uh, we were brought up in an institution, and I suppose mm. institutions have their pros and their cons. Uh, hostile environment. Can, uh, you know, I'm, 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 I'm just trying to dig this out because I know there must be people, children in school or children who left school who look at problems that they're facing and think, my God, why is this happening to me? Is this unique to me? But all of us have gone through this, right? Uh, children, as you said, uh, others can be cruel. It's not nothing to do with the school, but that's the way uh, it happens. So how do you deal with that? And can you give us an incident? So, yeah, I will. But, you know, as I said, I looking back, I feel it's all fine. While I was there, it was awfully painful. And I always find, I think this is important for me to share that I, you know, when I said that I was this fat person and therefore, uh, you know, a bit weird, I was also, uh, you know, always considered myself a little peculiar from the way people talk to me dealt with me, which is, um, I actually had one of my seniors once say to me, you're the ugliest person I have ever seen, which uh, was 
So yeah, and yeah. I had I I had insults from my uh, from some of my teachers, extremely insulting. I don't know, you know, teachers can be. Um, I mean, I have been through a lot of processes to come out of that, and they don't. I mean, it's all forgiven completely. I don't hold anything against anyone, but not forgotten because you know it's still there. I remembered something that happened to my brother. Actually, it's some, not something that happened to him directly, but it's something he participated in, in a way. So my brother's Ravi and he, Ravi Savur, and he was in the same batch actually as Kalpana and and, and when he was in prep school, there was this, I don't remember the details, but I know there was this episode where one of the staff members had a, a grudge against one of his classmates. And it was, you know, he put out word that this don't talk to this guy. So nobody was talking to him. And my brother, for some reason, could not bear to have to not talk to him. So he would hang around with him. And then there was another person who was a loner. So he came. And so three of them, there were three of them hanging around together, walking around. Uh, during uh, break time, whatever, and nobody would talk to them. And this went on till the end of the term and the teachers noticed. And one thing I remember was Bull uh, hearing about Bull Mukherjee uh, inviting them for tea one day because, you know, to show his sympathy and solidarity. And of course, that was a huge big deal because they had tea in China cups and they probably had cake, which was... <laughs> for a Lawrence school kid, that was a big deal. I don't think they would have had condensed milk. They would have had okay. to <laughs> <laughs> but, but your grounding as a writer also started in school. And it also started because of encouragement that you got from uh, some teachers. There. I really am so grateful to my English teacher, Mr. Uman, unfortunately no more, to Mr. Mohan Raj, librarian, who really, uh, you know, supported me. I think I was the editor of the Laurentian because Mr. Mohan Raj insisted that I should be. And of course, our principal, Mr. Vyas uh, Woody. Uh, so he used to do this amazing thing, Santil. Uh, I remember once, I, I mean, he would always tell everyone if he was introducing me to anyone, oh, this is Saz and she's such a great writer. I remember we had visitors to, for tea and he called me and he said, I want you to meet them. And this is Saz, you know, her father's a planter and she's such an amazing writer. And he's actually laughing, thinking of something which he'd read written by me in the Laurentian. So I think that kind of uh, support and, um, you know, that really takes care a lot. Uh, so before we uh, end, uh, I know you were great at accents. I'm going to ask you to uh, say something in an accent that you treasured in school. Then they live into a very good school, you know. <laughs> we learned the best quality English. I had a very good vocabulary and, you know, sentence construction and... We learned Shakespeare, a lot of poems, and it was really a very good experience. Right. Now, not, not just the experience in school, you also very quickly, before I think we're running out of time, uh, you've often spoken about how at very critical periods of your life, the fact that you were a Laurentian uh, helped you because you, you got crucial help from the whole OL network. I'm so glad you remembered that, Santhal, because I would have hated to end without saying this. Being a Laurentian has meant so much. It's changed my life, you know. I've met people at random when I've been in real trouble and just talking to people, interviewing people, and then it comes out without meaning to that, oh, we were in the same school. And um, people senior to me. And suddenly my life is different because I've been given a job or, you know, something like that happened. That, that actually happened to me when before I got my, uh, you know, I was telling you that I had this time when uh, I started writing and I was interviewing somebody who, who is a psychiatrist and he said like, oh, you are, are you, you know, he, when, when I, when he heard I was with, uh, I, I was also from Lawrence and he realized that I am a single parent who doesn't have an income. He gave a job at the NGO where he was that he was running as to do their documentation and you know so that I did that for a few months. Yeah, yeah. that's that's something about the school. All of us have those uh, stories to share about uh, the the joy and the rewards of being an old Lawrence Shah. Thank you so much. I think we are completely run out of time, so I'm going to hand this back to Kalpana. Who's possibly got a question for you, Kalpana? Thank you so much, Santil. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Thank you, for choosing me to uh, do this. Uh, 
Thank you very much, Sentil. Thank you, Saz. Saz, I truly, truly enjoyed hearing all that you had to share with us. I mean, you had me laughing at some point in time. Sentil, the questions were great. And I am I am truly grateful that you were very honest with, you know, many things in school. These are things that people face and uh, it's important to bring them up. So thank you very, very much for that, Saz. Nice. But before we wrap up, I have one question. What do you look forward to next? Okay, like uh, uh, I said, you know, you weave as you go. So I'm not sure what I'm doing next. I know for the last five years, I've just, you know, my kids grew up. Uh, my parents are no more. So I've been like a wild beast let out of the cage, just <laughs> traveling and uh, doing, you know, taking whatever projects come my way. I never say no. But because of this lockdown, uh, my gears have changed and I don't know. So let's see what happens. If there's adversity, maybe creativity will happen again. Otherwise, maybe it's just going to be happily ever after with, you know, silly novels and um, bag, of, uh, bag of chips or whatever. Thank you. Thanks, Kalpana. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Saz. Thanks very, very I much. I get a chance to say that, you know, my parents loved Senthil and they were so proud of him and I'm so happy he was, um, you know, he agreed to do this with me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Rowan, back to you. Yeah. Close thank you. Up. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Saz. Thank you, Senthil. Uh, you know, you know, sometimes uh, when we do these programs, you wonder what people are going to talk about. And uh, it's the whole thing because we had good times, we had sad times, we had bad times. But yeah, but I think what was important that uh, both SARS and Central ended and it reinforced that school had so much of a positive difference in our lives. And that 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 concept and that energy is what motivates a lot of us, myself. And uh, you know, like like I mentioned last time, we've got a great team of folks uh, working to make this happen. And I want to share something here. Okay, let's see. Oh, here we have it. So we've got Rashid Kapadia from 77 and Arjun, Captain Arjun Nair uh, from 75. I've forgotten the houses, but it's okay. Uh, Rashid has been a backbone, uh, a pillar of our team. He works with all of us, 10 of us. We work from our, you know, various locations all over the world with our presentations, our lighting, uh, you know, I'm a bit smarter today because of his instruction and his advice. And he's, a, he's like a great elder brother and coach and guide. He's put something up, actually. He was the first poster on the, uh, the Laurentian, um, the Laurentian uh, marketplace. And uh, thank you so much, uh, Rashid, for all your help and supporting the entire team. And we will see you as well as a panelist one of these days, one of these months. And of course, on, on your right, we have Captain Arjun Nair, who today is not the co-host because Kalpana had that uh, you know, uh, responsibility, but Arjun has been working behind the scenes with the transition and the timing and stuff like that. And oh, this is the initial stage of OL Nation. As you can see, we are pretty relaxed, but we're talking some serious business, such in uh, Abraham out there. Uh, <laughs> I think you know he's. Uh, I think he was a bit tired, but uh, yeah, he gave us a valuable, valuable input. Murad Lala, as you can see, even though he's an oncologist, his first love is aviation. And uh, we've got Adrian, Nikhil, Arjun, Atul, Dinesh. Of course, he's just probably swam 25 kilometers before coming in for the meeting. And we've got the rest of the guys too. And with that, we end this evening's session. I want to thank all of you, all Laurentians, Laurentians, friends of Lovedale. I understand we've got some of our board members participating on YouTube as well, and the families. Thank you once more, and we look forward to seeing you again on the 26th of September, where we have a very heavy hitting topic. I will send you the teaser in a couple of days, and that's all. Namaste. Happy 